والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين All praise due to Allah and your last peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day The topic, the way is one is a topic which deals with the view of Islam to the world, to religion, to God. It encompasses the basic concept of Tawheed and at the same time it addresses a basic principle of da'wah that is calling to Allah based on <clears throat> the realities of revelation human beings in this world meaning that as we invite people to Islam we invite them first and foremost to the oneness of Allah. This is where our da'wah, our call to Islam begins. With the oneness of Allah, as Prophet Muhammad وسلم, did when he sent emissaries or governors to various provinces, he would instruct them that the first thing that they should uh, teach the people, educate them to, is the oneness of Allah. And if they had accepted this, then he would go on to the obligation of Salah. When everything began with the oneness of Allah, Tawheed. <coughs> and when we call people in the society, we do the same. What is most important in Dawa? is that people accept the oneness of Allah. Now people may want to discuss about everything else. They may want to discuss about the latest situations in the world, the World Trade Center, or our brother and others you know, who are involved in all kinds of activities for which Islam is accused of this and that and you know, terrorism and all these other things. These may be the hot topics of conversation. This is what people want to discuss. And of course, one has to respect uh, their desire to want to have information or maybe they want to argue or whatever. So we may begin with them initially there, but the goal has to be to get them to accept the oneness of Allah. Because ultimately all the discussion in the world will be of no avail, will be of no benefit unless they come to the oneness of Allah. As the Prophet said, Man qala la ilaha illallah dakhala jannah That is the bottom line. Whoever declares that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. That is the key to paradise. So therefore, whatever da'wah we give, whatever invitation we make, it should focus on the oneness of Allah. Well, when we're calling people, who don't believe in Allah at all, obviously the first step would be to get them to accept the existence of Allah before we could even get into issues of is Allah one or not. But in general, uh, most people do have a basic belief in God. So it's about cleaning up that belief, getting them to the core, Allah is one. He 
he is uniquely one. This is the essence of Islam. Now, after that, after a person has accepted Allah, his existence and his oneness, the issue then comes to religion. <coughs> Which religion should we follow? All the religions say basically the same thing in terms of not stealing, not cheating, you know. All the religions tend to have good moral principles. This is what attracts people to them. But maybe the, base, the, the, the differences will lie now in terms of that fundamental belief. Really only in Islam is the belief clear with regards to the oneness of Allah. Others may say there is only one God, the Jews. They say Allah is one. However, their understanding of Allah is distorted. They have attributed to Allah the attributes of His creation. He created the world in six days, got tired and took a rest on the seventh. That's what it says in the Bible. God rested on the seventh day. So this is distorted. They have made Allah like human beings. They also write that Allah repented from what He planned to do to His people. Allah repented. Repented to who? This is problematic, isn't it? Human beings repent. Allah doesn't repent. They even have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrestling with Jacob, Prophet Yaqub. In fact, they say the name is Israel. And this name Israel means the one who wrestled with God. According to their uh, teachings uh, in Hebrew, they claim Israel means the one who wrestled with God. So they have a story in the Bible that God came down in the form of a man and wrestled with Yaqub. And Yaqub was beating him. And uh, he told Yaqub to let him go and he would give him a blessing. And he let him go and then he gave him the title Israel. So you see their idea, though they, they have an idea of one God, this idea has become distorted. God is having human characteristics. In fact, He is their personal God, the Lord God of Israel. He's not, nobody else is God. The Israelis are the chosen people. In fact, you read the Talmud, they tell you that they are the only people. The rest of us are animals who Allah gave forms that look like human beings so that it would be easy for the Jews, His chosen people, to deal with. You know, if you had to deal with a person who's like a camel, right? That's difficult, you know. Camel, they belong in the barn, but you know, if the camel looked like a human being, then it would be easier. You could sit down with them, you could talk with them, and these kind of things. So according to their teachings, in the Talmud, the rest of us, non-Jews, Gentiles, the Goyim, we are really animals who Allah gave an appearance, a surah, we look like human beings. So it's make it easy for the chosen people to deal with us. <coughs> so God for them is a special God. It's their God alone. Obviously, he's not our God. He's the Lord God of Israel. So they have a personal God. And this personal God for them, whenever they need things, you know, they call him and he does the things for them. So the God is sort of like the genie. You know, Aladdin and the lamp. When the lamp, the genie comes out, he asks, what do you want? He says, I want this, that, and the other. So God for them is functioning like a genie. Hmm? A jinn, a genie in Arabic. Huh? Then for the Christians, they say, we believe in one God too. But of course, that one God is three gods in one. How is that? Well, there's God the Father, God the Son, 
God the Holy Spirit. Three gods in one. One yet three, three yet one. So Jesus was God. And he prayed. It's mentioned in the Bible that Jesus prayed. So who was he praying to? Well, some of the people when they get this question, they say, well, he was praying to show the people how they should pray. That's the problem. If he was praying to God, and he is God, you have a problem praying to himself. <laughs> Nonsensical. So some try to explain it that way. But of course, that's not what the text say. The text say he called on God, according to their texts. So <clears throat> this idea of believing in one God, they have different religions. Only in Islam is the belief in one God correct. And that's why we say there is only one religion. That's Islam. All of the other religions are fake, man-made. Human beings fabricated it. And if we consider the human race, leave aside the Jewish version of their explanation, if we consider the human race as one race, one people, having the same emotional, psychological, social desires, makeup, they function the same way. Wherever you go in the world, there is a common denominator of for human beings, wherever you are. Whether you're in the jungles of the Amazon, you're an Eskimo on the North Pole, wherever you are, same basic things are happening. A human being is a human being, wherever he is on the face of this earth. Logic tells us that if God is going to reveal religion, the way of life to people, He's not going to reveal one religion to the Eskimo and another one to the Indian in the Amazon, another one to the Arab on the desert, another one to the uh, person in, the, in China in the desert or in the jungles of Indonesia, wherever, all over the place. He didn't reveal a variety of different religions because that would <coughs> cause confusion. When people came together, it would create confusion. If all of these religions were revealed religions from God, then we would have confusion. God doesn't want for us confusion. He wants clarity. He wants a correct way of life. So, he revealed for human beings one religion. The same religion he revealed for Adam is the same one he revealed for Abraham, Moses, David, Prophet Isa, and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa One religion. So we have one God. We have one human race. And we have one religion. Now there's some people who say, Actually, it doesn't matter which religion you follow. As long as you sincerely believe in God and practice your religion, whether you are a Buddhist or a Hindu, Confucianist or a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim, it's all the same. That the religions are like spokes on a wheel. In the wheel it has a hub and it has spokes that go out that hold the actual rim Right? And the wheel. He said all the religions are like that. God is the center, all the religions lead to God. You have some people who call themselves Muslims and actually say this. They are known as perennialists. This belief, of course, is false. It's not acceptable. Inna dina inda Allahi al-Islam. 
religion with Allah is just Islam, finish. Of course, they will say, well, you know what is meant by Islam here is submission. So as long as you're submitting, then you're following Islam. So when, if you're a Buddhist submitter, or you're a Hindu submitter, you're a Muslim, it's all the same. No. This is not what was understood by this verse. In the generation of the Prophet Muhammad when he taught it, what was understood was Islam. The religion of Islam. So, as we accept that there is only one God, one human race, needing only one religion, not a multitude of religions, the next step is how do we follow that religion? Again, you'll find people saying, you can follow it in a variety of different ways. You can follow it as a Hanafi, it's one way. Or you can follow it as a Shiite. Or you can follow it as a Sufi. Or you can follow it, it doesn't matter really. As long as you are believing in Allah, pillars of Islam, Iman, then it's all the same. Spokes on the wheel. Back to our wheel again with the spokes. Allah is the center. The different spokes mean different ways you follow Islam. Now, just as we reject that, just as we reject that, in the case of a variety of religions, we must also reject that in the case of Islam itself. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not leave behind him a variety of versions of Islam. He didn't leave different ways to follow Islam. He left only one way. This is the topic of this evening's presentation. The way is one. In all respects, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, left behind him one way. <clears throat> and the Quran itself decries, defames, speaks against sects, groups, ways, other ways other than the one way. We find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعَا كُلُّ حِزْبٍ بِمَا لَدَيْهِمْ فَرِحُونَ Do not be like the pagans. This is the state of the pagans. Who split up their religion into a number of different sects. Each sect or each group happy with what it has. I know some people say, well, ikhtilaf ummati rahma. But ikhtilaf ummati rahma is not a hadith from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is a fabrication. It's not authentic. This Differences among my ummah is a mercy. You hear people repeating this. The differences among the ummah is a mercy. It's not a mercy. It's not a mercy. It's a curse. Allah speaks against it. We also find, for example, in Surah Al-An'am, Allah says there, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ فَرَّقُوا دِينَهُمْ وَكَانُوا شِيَعًا لَسْتَ مِنْهُمْ فِي شَيْءٍ Indeed, those who split up their religion into sects, you, Muhammad وسلم, have nothing to do with them. You have nothing to do with them. This is not Islam. Islam is one. There is no Sufi Islam, Shiite Islam, 
Hanafi Islam. There is just Islam. The one Islam which Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left behind him. In fact, we have a hadith narrated by Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan in which he said Allah's Messenger stood up amongst us and said, Indeed those before you from the people of the book divided into 72 sects. 71 of them in hell and one in paradise. And you will divide up into 73 different sects. 72 of them in hell and one in paradise. The one in paradise is the Jama'ah, the main group. In another narration he said, Ma'ana alayhi al-yawm ashabi What I am following today and my companions. It's one. Of course, when he spoke of the different sects, he did refer them to them as being from his ummah. So it means they're Muslims. So these people have become non-Muslims. This doesn't include people like the Qadianis, the Ahmadis, you know, followers of Rashad Khalifa. They call themselves Submitters International. I don't know if you run into them on the internet. They're very active in promoting their own version. Do you know about Rashad Khalifa? Never heard of him. Well, Rashad Khalifa was this Egyptian scientist uh, in the United States who, back in the 70s, claimed to have discovered the numerical, mathematical numerical miracle of the Quran, 19. He claimed that 19 was the mathematical miracle of the Quran, this number 19. And he went through, at that time, of course, computers were in their early stages. And he had this huge computer cal calculation, he put it out in a book and everything. You know, the computer uh, speaks, you know, the Quran, the ultimate miracle. And uh, <clears throat> he showed how Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, it consists of 19 letters, right? And in, the, in Surah Al-Muddathir, Alayha Tisa'ata Ashar. You know, over it are 19. And he goes on and he goes into the, the letters, the, what they call Al-Huruf al muqattaat these uh, disjointed letters at the beginnings of the surahs, Alif, Lam, Meen, you know, Qaf, uh, Sad, and all these. And he said, he showed how each letter is a multiple of 19 within each chapter. And he goes on and on and all these 19. People were amazed. You know, and he became very popular in the MSA. MSA took him all around the country, he's giving lectures all around. Ahmed did that, he got a hold of the man's thing and he made a book on it, the Qur'an's do miracle, miracle, and he's, you know, using it in his, in his debates with the Christians and that, you know. Then, about 1979, at a conference, I think it was held in Morocco, he announced in his conference there, the conference there, that from his calculations of the multiples of 19 and its intricacy in the Quran, etc., that he was able to determine the exact date of Yawm Qiyamah. When he said that, he lost most of his following, right? That was it. Muslims now had to back off, right? Because of course, anybody claims he has knowledge of Yawm Qiyamah, you know, when, when the angel Jibreel asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he asked, well, Allah, what is, what, is the, what is the, when is the final hour? He said, I don't know any more than you do. This is Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Here's Rashad Khalifa saying, I know when the exact date of Yawm Qiyamah is. Okay. And after that, you know, he just went from bad to worse. After that, then he denied the Sunnah altogether. He said, from his calculations, he realized that the Quran is, is, is all that we need, you know. 
because everything in some verse in the Quran where Allah says, you know, that um, uh, what is it? Uh, Everything, there's nothing left out of the book. So let's finish. We don't need sunnah after that. What is this sunnah? Hadith, people made it up and you know, he went along there. Because very important now to establish his own new religion, he has to break, cut people off from the sunnah. So he started there. The next thing we know he claimed by the um, uh, mid 80s, he claimed that he found from his mathematical calculations, that two verses in the Quran were false. Yeah. Initially, when he started off in the early 70s, he said his, his main uh, uh, aim was to prove that the Quran that we have is perfect. It is a miracle from Allah, you know, change. So next thing we know, in the middle of the 80s, he's now claiming that two verses in the Quran are false. And, uh, because these numbers actually, when, he when the people were making, checking his calculations, they found that it was a bit off. So if he took out these two verses, then his calculations were right. So he said they must be false, proof of the 19. Then by the late um, 80s, he claimed, what else? Prophethood. He said, I am the messenger of Allah. You know, the 19 proves it. Then he goes and shows how his name is, you know, you add up the letters and the values, it's a multiple of 19 and you know, it's in the Quran and he goes into this story. And Alhamdulillah, 1991, some brave brother went and assassinated him. He was assassinated in uh, Tucson, Arizona. They found him in the morning dead. Stabbed to death. With his gun, he had his gun with him. And he had predicted before that, that nobody would kill him. Because he was a prophet of Allah. You know? So this was actual proof to finish him off. He was assassinated. They looked high and low to find out who it was, but Alhamdulillah, whoever did it, did it the right way. Not telling anybody. <laughs> you know? This thing has to be done, you do it, you, you're the only one who knows about it. MashaAllah. May Allah give him paradise. So, that was the end of Rashad Khalifa. But his followers still keeping their stuff going, still promoting it. You know, they, it died out in the early 90s, it got very weak, you didn't hear very much from them. But with the rise of the internet, when they got out to the internet, they started promoting their things again. They call themselves, as I said, Submitters International. Right? And of course, you know, Rashad Khalifa, when he denied Sunnah and everything else, then, uh, you know, the religion became his own interpretation. They, in their mass, I can't really call it a mosque, really, in Tucson, Arizona, it was, we call it a temple. In their temple, you know, the men and women prayed side by side in the rows. The soft men and women. The women, you know, they don't wear hijab, they wear short sleeve, no head cover, and so they pray side by side. Sometimes when he's not there, his wife used to lead salah. You know, this was their practices. I mean, in other words, they made their own, he made his own religion. So somebody like that, we don't consider him to be, or in that group, Submitters International, or the Ahmadiyya, or the Qadiyya, and his Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's followers, we don't consider them to be a part of Islam. When we talk about the 73 sects, they're not among them. These are people outside of Islam altogether. But, Prophet when he spoke of 73 sects from the Ummah, he talked, meant amongst people who are still Muslims, and they would divide up into some 73 different sects. But only one of them would be going to paradise. He specified there's only one. And he clarified that that one was the one following what he was doing, what he was following, and what his companions were following. So that represents the main understanding or path that we have to follow Islam. And we also have a hadith from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud in which he's mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ drew a line in the dust and then he drew some lines on either side of it. That straight line he said, this one in the middle is the path of Allah. The path of Allah. And the lines on either side 
So these are different paths, each one with a devil at the end of it calling people to it. These are the different paths. And then he recited the verse, وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاتِ مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِي And this is my straight path, so follow it. And do not follow the other paths as they would separate you from this path. Ibn al-Qayyim, discussing this verse, had said, this is because the path leading to Allah is only one. And it is what he sent his messengers and sent his books with. No one reaches him except by this path. Even if, it, if people take every other path and try to open every other door, these paths will be blocked and these doors will be locked with the exception of one path. For indeed, it is connected to Allah and leading to Him. And whoever views the path as being long, then his pace will be weakened. There's only one way. There are no shortcuts. And this is what the Sufi uh, groups offer. What attracts people to Sufism is the shortcut. So the shortcut, you don't have to do what everybody else is doing. There's this outer Islam, and then there's this hidden inner Islam. Like the skin of the orange, and the core, the inside part, the skin, is the outer, and the inner is the core, which is where all the juice is. You eat the skin, what are you going to get? So, the mass of Muslims, they're caught up with the skin. They say, we have the, the real orange, the inside. Okay. Hey, well, so, how do, we, how do we get to this real orange? Well, you must make bay'ah to our sheikh. Okay. That is the door. You have to make the bay'ah. And of course, when you ask, where did the shaykh get this special knowledge from, of the orange, you say, well, he got it from his shaykh. Where did his shaykh get it? From his shaykh. And where is it? From his shaykh. And they trace it all the way back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Now, as far as we know, Rasulullah Sallallahu he taught everybody. He taught, he taught Islam to everybody. But they know. Yes, he did ta teach general Islam to everybody. But when he was in the cave, remember during the time of the Hijrah, right? he and Abu Bakr, they were alone in the cave. This is when he taught that secret knowledge to Abu Bakr. Nobody else knew. And Abu Bakr, he passed it on and so on and so on. So this is a common claim that all of these different Sufi groups have, and they have this special chain of knowledge. Of course, when you go and look at the chain, you will find the top people who are known. Abu Bakr, you know, maybe Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Hassan al-Basri, you know, they name classical people who nobody can deny these are righteous people. But now for them to link it up with their chain of milkshakes, they have to stick somebody in there to link as their link. Who is that person? Anybody know who is the person they, they, they use? No, no, no. He's down the line. Huh? No, no. Mahdi? No, Mahdi is coming. <laughs> no, the person they always stick in the chain, you can go back and check their names, is Khidr. Khidr is the one, you know, because this is the whole thing, everything is about Khidr, so they stick Khidr in there. Because for, according to their belief, Khidr is still alive. You know? They, 
he is still alive and amongst us like this uh, there's a figure in the Bible called Melchizedek he said he has no beginning of time and no ending of days he's an eternal being so he said like uh, Khidr is like this he was alive at the time of Musa he's alive till today of course Prophet Muhammad had said to his companions on one occasion he said nobody who is alive on the earth today will be alive after 100 years that's it finish anybody who was alive on the earth at that time 100 years later finish nobody's living past that point so what happened to Khidr? But of course they select only hadith which they want these kind of hadith that you don't hear it mentioned in the circles because Khidr is a very important key figure for them linking them up with the secret knowledge and of course <coughs> they tell the followers you must be to the Shaykh like Prophet Musa was to Khidr in what sense? well Prophet Musa was told you don't ask me any questions I'm going to do some things and it's, you're not going to be able to understand it, but don't ask me about it. So that's the way you're supposed to be with the Sheikh. As Khidr was able to do these things, Prophet Musa couldn't understand it until Khidr explained to him, that's the way the Sheikh is. And you must be with the Sheikh like that. Another way they say it, the Murid, in relationship to a Sheikh, should like, be like a dead body in the hands of the washers, those who are washing the body. You know, the dead body, you can turn it this way, that way, whatever. That's, that's how you should be with your sheikh. So, what does that mean? Practically speaking, you may see the sheikh drinking alcohol in front of you. And you don't question it. You don't question it. Why? Because what appears to you to be alcohol, is not really alcohol. It only appears that way. And with that, that's why you find a number of these different Sufi tariqas, they ended up in massive corruption, really serious corruption, incredible stuff, all on this basis, because the followers could not question. You don't question the Sheikh. You accept it. Now, of course, reality is what? Can we compare ourselves to Prophet Musa? Can the Sheikh be compared to Khidr? No. Khidr was receiving revelation. Prophet Musa was receiving revelation. You can't make this comparison. It is inappropriate. The only person that we as human beings can treat in that manner is who? Prophet Muhammad is the only one. Is the only one that we don't have to question. You don't have to question why, how, because our declaration of faith is our declaration of belief in whatever he tells us, no matter how unusual it might sound to us. As long as it comes to us through an authentic chain. This is authentic information from the Sunnah, then we have to believe it. That's our declaration of faith. We believe in it. Without question. Even we don't understand. Our senses tell us when the sun sets, right? The earth has turned. The sun is no longer visible to us. It sets. And as the earth turns, we come and see the sun again. Prophet Muhammad said, asked his companions, Do you know where the sun goes when it sets? And they said, No, Allah and his messenger knows. He said, It goes and prostrates beneath the throne of Allah. And it doesn't get up from that prostration until Allah gives it permission and then it comes back. Now what we see, yeah, 
as far as our physics, etc., tells us that the earth turns, we don't want to see the sun. But when the sun is set for us here, it's still visible for those in Vancouver. Isn't it? And when it sets for Vancouver, it's still visible for those in Hawaii. And so on and so forth. So in other words, the sun is always visible somewhere on the earth, and it is always setting on somewhere else on the earth. So what do we do with what the Prophet ﷺ said? Do we just submit? That's what he said. Whether we can understand, comprehend how it, how we fit this into place or not, we say, Samiana wa ta'ala. Finish. We hear and we obey. We believe, we accept. That is our commitment. That is our declaration of faith. And that is only for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. No other human being deserves that status. Well, for those who follow the Sufi path, well, there are many people who they put in this place. And basically, they invite people to worship these people. And in worshiping these people, you have shortcuts. For example, Sheikh Nazim al-Qubrusi, who claims to be the head of the Naqshbandi Sufi order, one branch of the Naqshbandis, is very popular in Europe, in the West, comes to, to, uh, to England. His uh, Khalifa in America is Kabbani. I'm sure you've heard of Kabbani's. He met with the FBI, CIA, and White House and warned them against the extremists, the Wahhabis and the Salafis. These extremist Muslims, you have to be careful of them. Kabbani is this Khalifa in America. Anyway, Snake Nazim said that uh, his followers, told his followers, if you are a true murid, true follower of mine, then when the time comes for you to die, the angel of death will not take your soul. I will take your soul and hand it over to the angels of the Barzakh. And when you are in that state of the Barzakh, state of the grave, and the angels, Munkar and Nakir, come and ask you, Man Rabbuk, Ma Dinuk, Ma Nabiyuk, I will be there to whisper the answers to you. <laughs> this is what these people teach. This is the shortcut, isn't it? You have nothing to worry about. Guaranteed place in paradise. So in these groups, you have the group of the Ismailis, for example. One branch of the Ismailis, they teach that um, Fajr, the name Fajr actually means Muhammad. And Duhur is Fatima. Asr is Ali. Maghrib is Hassan. And Aisha is Hussein. So if you say Muhammad, Fatima, Ali, Hassan, Hussein, you have done your five times daily prayers. <laughs> You've done your five times daily prayers. Huh? What about Qiyam al-Layl. <laughs> That's all of them together, you know. <laughs> so, this is shortcuts, isn't it? Everybody else has to pray and they are, but all you have to do is just say it. And you've done your five times daily. These are shortcuts. These are these groups which offer people shortcuts to paradise. And of course, it's satanic. It's from Satan. Because there is no shortcut. There is only one path, that one way, the path of Rasulullah And that way is not an easy way. It requires effort, striving, etc. In other words, 
paradise is not cheap. You know, you, it requires sacrifice. Sacrifice of the dunya. As Bab Sallallahu said, a dunya sijnul mu'min wa jannatul kafir. This is the sacrifice. We have to live in this world as we would in a prison. Limited. We cannot do everything we desire. We only do things within a limited scope. The scope limited by the Sharia. The rest we leave. That's for the Kafir. His dunya is this life. So that one way which was left by Rasulullah is the same one way that Allah refers to when He says, Hold on firmly to the rope of Allah together and do not split up that rope of Allah, the Quran. And its explanation, the Sunnah, as it was understood by the Sahaba, that is the one way, the rope that we need to hang on to. And Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, commenting on this verse, said, Indeed, this path is inhibited, sorry, is inhabited. The path, this one path, the rope of Allah representing the path, is inhabited. For there are devils present there. And they call out, O slave of Allah, come. This is the path. In order to prevent people from the path of Allah. So hold on to the rope of Allah. And that is the book of Allah. And this straight path, Prophet Muhammad explained for us in detail, this was his responsibility. Allah gave him that responsibility. Saying, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ We have revealed to you the reminder in order that you make clear for the, to the people what was revealed for them. That was the duty of Prophet Muhammad He would clarify that sunnah for us. And he clarified it in such a way that the companions understood it clearly. Now each companion may not have understood each and every detail of it, but as a group of followers, they understood it. And they conveyed it. They narrated from him that he said, تَرَكْتُكُمْ عَلَى مَحَجَّةٍ بَيْضَى لَيْلُهَا كَنَهَارِهَا لَا يَزِيغُ عَنْهَا إِلَّا هَالِكْ I've left you on a clear white plain whose day is like its night. Anyone who deviates from it falls into destruction. So the religion and its teachings were clear. Clearly left behind. The companions they conveyed it to the next generation and to the generation after. And as it was conveyed, the, those who studied it, studied it freely. They sat under the scholars of their time in different parts of the Muslim world. They traveled and they studied, etc. Then a time came when people started to limit the sources of that information to set individuals. And we had a rising out of that period the four schools of thought, the four methods. And with it, you had further decline and degeneration in understanding of the path to the point where the four madhabs became like four different religions. Where it was ruled in the Hanafi madhab, 
that they were not allowed to marry Shafi'is. Mosques which were built during this era had, depending on where they were, if you were in Syria, they had two mihrabs, one for Hanafis and one for Shafi'is. They'd have two different salahs going on in the masjid. We have inherited some of that. We have inherited till today some of that. You have some places, I've been to masjids in, in different parts, in, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, etc., where you had communities of Indians who were from Shafi'i and Hanafi backgrounds. So they would have Asr for the Shafi'is and Asr for the Hanafis. They had two Asrs, Asr prayers. So some of it's still around. Anyway, we know that around the Kaaba itself, they had four different maqams. They call maqam, you know everybody knows maqam Ibrahim. This is the one we go make hajj, you know, we pray to salahs in that vicinity. But prior to 1925, for hundreds of years before that, you had other maqams. Not just that one, you had a maqam which they call maqam Hanafi, maqam Shafi, maqam Hanbali, and maqam Maliki. And what used to happen is that when the time for Salah came, an Imam from the Hanafi Madhab, he would go and stand under the Maqam Hanafi. And the Hanafis who were making Tawaf were in the Kaaba praying or whatever, they would line up behind him and they'd pray. When it was finished, then the Maliki Imam he would go and stand under the Maqam and all the Malikis would pray with him. So you had four different salahs going on around the Kaaba for the five times different prayers. And people justified it. Felt very, you know. In fact, you have to this day people, well, things kind of died out. After a while, this, this uh, uh, rigid divisions, it's, it's kind of died out in the 20th century. But you have people who are trying to revive it and people who promote it. They'll say, for example, if you don't have an imam from one of the madhabs, then your imam is Satan. If you don't have an imam, your imam is Satan. And there was one writer, a Turkish writer, who was this Hanafi fanatic. In his book, his name was Hussein Ishik. In his book, where he writes there that one of the questions you will be asked in the grave is, and what is your madhab? <laughs> of course, the reality is that if you go back and ask the Sahaba, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, and Ali, leading Khulafa Rashidin, you ask them, what was your madhab? Are they going to say Hanafi or Shafi? And then again, if you ask Abu Hanifa himself, what was your madhab? These are going to say, I follow the Abu Hanifa madhab, the Hanafi madhab. Is it something? You know, they are just what? Asma sameetum wa antum wa ba'ukum. Names which you have made up, you and your forefathers. Because all of these scholars would, when they were actually asked, would say, we're following the madhab, if you want to say madhab, the way, madhab means tariqa, or way, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that's what we follow. As the sahaba followed it, the tabi'in followed it, we from among the tabi'in, tabi'in, or tabi'in, atba'a tabi'in, we try to follow the same thing. That's what they followed. And the early scholars, who studied, for example, they studied under Imam Malik, they studied under you know, Abu Hanif, they studied under wherever knowledge was available, they traveled and studied. This was their approach. They didn't really, you know, restrict themselves only to one. Instead, what you had coming up in order to defend the idea that you must stick to one, Madhab, they say, you know, this is what they call Tatambu uh, Ruchas. You go from one Madhab to another, then you're going to be sent astray because you're just looking for the easy way you go from one madhab to another technically speaking it is true if a person is just going looking for ease he's not looking for the truth 
whether he goes to a madhab or he goes anywhere, he's going to go astray. Because he's not seeking the truth. But those who are seeking the truth, the fact that you ask one scholar, you ask another scholar, you ask another, and you hear the evidences that they're bringing, and you follow the one which convinces you, this is the right of each and every human being. To follow what sounds convincing and accurate from somebody who they respect, etc. This is the right we all have. Nothing wrong with that at all. Instead, what happens with these guys is that they get caught up when they get locked into these madhab type things. You find them making some of the most peculiar rulings. One of the rules I heard, that some people who are from the Shafi madhab, they told me, <coughs> scholars in India, tell them, when you're going to make Hajj, because according to Hanafi, it's a Shafi madhab, if you accidentally touch a woman, your wudu is gone. Right? And that will create all kinds of problems for you in different places you're moving, you know, you can't help but touch women. So, you know, to avoid all the problems that are going to come when this happened, they said, the scholars told them, that when you are making your intention for Hajj, you make the intention to be a Hanafi at the same time. So you go make Hajj as a Hanafi. When you come back, you make your intention to be back to Shafi. Because Hanafi's position, if you touch a woman, doesn't break your wudu, regardless. So, of course, this is ludicrous. This is ludicrous. The proper way is to find the evidence. The one who is correct, that's what you follow. The other one, you leave it. Shouldn't be flipping back and forth like this. So, this whole issue of madhab is not to say that a person cannot follow a scholar who has been trained from a particular madhab. No, we can. That is the training of that scholar, the knowledge he passes on to you, it is from that madhab. It is permissible for us to follow. The common person, as they say, the common person basically, his madhab is the madhab of the scholar that he follows. Whatever the scholar is following, he has to follow it. He has no choice but taklid here. His only point of ijtihad, because everybody has to make some ijtihad, his point of ijtihad is only in choosing which scholar he will follow. He will make taklid of. That's what he has. So, it doesn't matter really, a person may choose any scholar who is reputable, etc., practicing to follow this individual. But he follows it seeking an understanding, meaning he doesn't just ask the scholar and the scholar tells him yes, no, right, wrong, just like this. No. He finds out what's the evidence. The scholar explains to him, well, this is the case, this is the hadith, this is Quran, whatever, so and so on. Follows it in that way, ala basira, you know, having knowledge in that following. So, if he asks another scholar and he finds better evidence with that scholar, seems to be much more supported, a stronger presentation, then he follows that. It's not a problem. This is not the tabur This is not running after, you know, loopholes. This is seeking the truth and following what appears to you to be the most accurate. Now, on one occasion, Ibn Ibn Zubair said to Ibn Abbas, whilst Ibn Abbas was teaching about making Umrah in the ten days before Hajj, he said to him, Way beyond to you, way hack. You are sending people astray. You are instructing them to make Umrah in the ten days before Hajj, and there is no Umrah then. Ibn Abbas said to him, Go ask your mother. The mother, 
the mother of all Wawas, was mother of Roma. Asma, the sister of Aisha. She says, go ask your mother. But Allah is insisting. Indeed, Abu Bakr and Omar didn't say the same thing. Right? He knows that his mother doesn't agree with that. His mother says the same thing that Ibn Abbas was saying. But Abu Bakr and Omar, they didn't say the same thing. And they have more knowledge of Allah's Messenger and are more in keeping with the Sunnah than you. Or oh, oh, was quite, you know, uh, bringing his case here, right? For Abu Bakr and, and Omar's position. And Abbas said, so this is where you are coming from. We come to you with Allah's Messenger and you come to us with Abu Bakr and Omar. Woe be on you. Are they more preferable to you or what is in Allah's book and the sunnah of his messenger which he left among his companions and his ummah? I see you falling into destruction. I say Allah's messenger said and he says Abu Bakr and Omar forbade. See, that tendency existed even amongst the Tabi'in, amongst the Sahaba. And with this tendency to want to lean to notable individuals, Abu Bakr, Omar is the first Khalifa, second Khalifa, you know, their opinion, etc. It's not true. People tend to lean like that. But the bottom line is if the statement of Allah's Messenger is brought, then it is unacceptable to go to anyone's opinion. This was something which was unanimous amongst the leading scholars that who they now attribute madams to. They were unanimous on the position that when a hadith from Rasulullah was brought, it was unacceptable for a Muslim to go to the opinion of anyone else. Not acceptable. So <clears throat> we find that the understanding of the Sahaba whereby precedence was given to the Quran and the Sunnah, this is the correct understanding. The leading scholars who we look now at as being the scholars of the Madhabs, you know, that was their understanding, that's what they sought to follow. So that's what comes to us today. That one way is following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his madhab. Any scholar that we follow, we know we are following him because he is clarifying for us the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he is a human being. He is a human being. So it means that whatever he is conveying to us is to the best of his ability. No doubt he will make some mistake some way, sometime. And if we realize his mistake, then it is forbidden for us to follow him. Forbidden. At that point where he has made that mistake, it's forbidden. Now he may be rewarded for his mistake. He made his ijtihad, he studied the research, and that's what he came to. But it was a mistake. Prophet Sallam said that the, the one, the judge, who makes the ijtihad, and he's wrong, he gets one reward. If he's right, he gets two. So that scholar that we're following will get the, you know, get the reward for his mistake. But for us who knows it's a mistake, for us to follow it is wrong. There's no reward there for us. We can't say, well, we're just following the scholar. No. If we know evidence indicates other than what the scholar is saying, then we are obliged to follow 
the evidence. This is why when Imam Malik was asked, if a person followed a Sahabi, a companion of Rasulullah in everything which he did, would he be on the correct path? And Imam Malik said, no. Unless that companion was himself correct. Because the truth is one. Al-Haq Wahid. The truth is one. And the only one free from mistake is the one in that grave. He pointed to the grave of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, this is what Islam calls us to. It calls us to belief in the one God. Belief in one religion. And belief that that religion may be followed in only one way. Followed in only one way. That way is the way referred to, we've heard this term in our times, as the way of the Salaf. The way of the Salaf. Salaf being the righteous early generations of Muslim scholars, from the Sahaba and those follow them. That's what the way of the Salaf is. And according to Arabic linguistics, a person who follows the way of the Salaf is called a Salafi. That's what it means. A person who commits himself to following the understanding of the Sahaba, of the Quran and the Sunnah. That is a Salafi. Now, today we have some people who say, we are the Salafis. And Salafi now means a group. A group which is an exclusive group, limited to only certain people. And these people sit up in judgment of everybody else. And they decide, though everybody else, a number of the people who have understood the way of the Salaf, etc., and say, okay, no, we are Salafis also, we're going on. Say, no, no, no. No, you're not a true Salafi. And you're not a true Salafi. And you're not a true Salafi. And if you don't agree with us that so-and-so is not a true Salafi, you're also not a true Salafi, you know. And they are now what we call the Manhaj police, right? They speak about the Manhaj, they, are the, they police the Manhaj. They determine who is the true Salafi and who isn't. Of course, nobody put them in that position of authority and they've gone to all kinds of extremes, you know, till they're shooting themselves in their own feet, you know, and Allah knows where they will end up. But the reality of Salafiyyah, the Salaf, and Salafi is accepting the Quran and the Sunnah as it was understood by the Sahaba and those scholars who followed their path from that point onwards. This is Salafiya. Whoever accepts that and tries to live by it is quote unquote a Salafi. Salafi is not a another group, organization, etc., but an approach to understanding the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Now somebody might say, well, why do we have to even use this name Salafi? Why bother? Well, one could say, why do we use the name Sunni? We use the name Sunni to distinguish between those who are following the Sunnah and those who are following the Shia. The Shia is used to distinguish between Ahlul Sunnah, Ahlul Sunnah al Jama'ah, those who follow the way of the Sunnah, and those who are split off and follow another way which they call, they call themselves the Shia. That term is used. We are Muslims, we are all Muslims. But we do distinguish between those who follow the Sunnah and those who do not. Similarly, we're all 
Sunnis, meaning we follow the Quran and Sunnah. But what way do we understand that Quran and Sunnah? We understand it according to the Salafi way. It is only for distinguishing between those people who say we follow Quran and Sunnah, but it is according to their own personal interpretations. They have set themselves up as authorities where they can go to the Quran and Sunnah and interpret it in ways which the Sunnah and his companions didn't understand. They are their own. Like for example, you have some people, for example, you ask them, Brother, sister, why, why are you celebrating the birthday of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu They say, because it is mentioned in the Quran. Yeah. They said, yes, it is mentioned in the Quran. So I said, please, please tell me, where, where is it mentioned in the Quran that we should celebrate the birthday of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? They say, the verse in which Allah says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُسَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهُ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا Now this is a verse, we all hear this in Jumu'ah every time. They say this means you should celebrate the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's birthday. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتُهُ يُسَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِي Indeed Allah and His angels send blessings on the Prophet. All you who believe send peace and blessings on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is what we understood. This means for us to say Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala ala Muhammad kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ala Ibrahim in the Hamdul Majid. This is what we understand. But these are the people who say, no, yeah, that's true, but it also means we should celebrate the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Where did you get it from? Well, this is what the Shaykh said. Our Shaykh said that. This is, the, this is the point. We say, did the Sahaba understand it that way? Oh, oh, oh. maybe not. Why? Because they weren't celebrating the birthday of the Prophet Sallallahu The celebration didn't start until some 400 years after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In fact, it started in Fatimid Egypt, when Egypt was ruled by the Fatimid Shiite dynasty, and they started the celebration of the Prophet Sallallahu birthday on the day when he died. Because they really didn't know when he was born. Prophet Rabi al-Awwal is not established fact that the Prophet Sallallahu was born on that day. It is established fact that he died on that day. But that he was born, we really don't know what day he was born on. So the Shiites began it. So this claim that that verse from the Quran is proof, or well that means we should celebrate Prophet Sallallahu birthday. See, if we don't have any means of determining is that right or wrong, we're lost. Or like the Shiites, for example, what they say concerning the verse in Surah Rahman, Maraj al Bahraini al Taqiyam, right? The two seas come together, right? We understand it is the fresh water and the salty sea you know, bodies. We understand elsewhere in the Quran Allah speaks about the fresh water bodies and the salt. salty. They say, no, no, no. That means Ali and Fatima. And when Allah goes on to say, that the curl and the pearl, pearl, coral come from it. We all know what the pearl and the coral is. They say, no, 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 no. That's Hassan and Hussein. So anybody can say it. What is our basis for saying that's not true? That's their claim. Our basis is that wasn't what the Sahaba understood. No Sahabi had this understanding. Therefore, what you are coming up with, we don't accept. This is the correct way to approach the Quran and the Sunnah. According to the understanding of the Sahaba. It is the one way. The way is one. That is the only way. It is the way of the same sect about which Prophet Muhammad had said that they would remain amongst us 
a group who would be holding on firmly to the religion and the correct understanding and it would not harm them no matter who went against them or who uh, betrayed them etc they would remain bahirin al haqq hatta ya'tihum amrullah they would remain firmly standing forth for the truth until the last day catches them that is the one way Some uh, examples of uh, where uh, their beliefs are corrupted and distorted, which are, I think, matter of fact. But uh, my point is, uh, in this uh, day and age, when uh, uh, there, are, there are so many rifts in the Ummah, unfortunately, do you think it is the best of times to really accentuate those uh, uh, differences uh, between uh, people of the book, when there are people of the book such as Noam Chomsky, for example, or uh, William Baker, who have the courage, the guts, who have the faith to go to uh, far away places, places where none of us uh, Muslims have ever stepped foot in, had the courage or means to go in, places like Kashmir, Afghanistan, uh, Palestine, etc. They had the courage, they had the faith in God. Their beliefs are their personal beliefs, but the facts on the ground are that they have been more, much more effective than us uh, Muslims in, in many respects. And when, when you want to narrow down Islam, in my opinion, in one word, that it all, it all comes down to justice, fighting for justice. And many of these Jews and Christians have stood up for what is right and what is just more than the average Muslim. And the uh, differences that you men mentioned uh, uh, between uh, the different uh, divisions in Islam, Sufis, uh, Shiites, and uh, uh, Sunnis. By the same token, I believe this is not the best of times to really accentuate those uh, differences. The differences do exist, but they are not so marked as to uh, really pinpoint and uh, you know, uh, accentuate really because the communalities are certainly by far more dominant. You uh, also, uh, as, as for the comment, uh, as, as for uh, what a uh, Sunnite believes in and what a Shiite believes in, as a uh, Shiite Muslim and a, uh, uh, as uh, a follower of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu uh, alayhi I, I personally consider myself as a uh, Sunni person because I do personally follow uh, the, the Prophet's uh, tradition. Uh, I do believe in Ishtahad as uh, Sunni brothers and sister, sisters do. And uh, at the same time, I, I, I do believe in Imam Ali and, and uh, his fight for justice again. So I don't think the difference between Shi Shiites and Muslims is uh, that Shiites do not follow the Sunnah and uh, Sunnis uh, follow the, uh, the Sunnah. I think uh, they, they, they both follow the Sunnah. The difference maybe is the legends, the figures, the prominent people in uh, these two very similar traditions. And uh, another quote about uh, Surah Al-Rahman, the fresh water and the, when the fresh water and the salt water mix. I exactly uh, came across the same inter interpretation that you uh, mentioned in the uh, uh, Shiite commentary that I just uh, read a little while ago. And that was the first time that I heard that uh, some Shiites uh, believe that uh, the fresh water and the sea water refer, refer to Ali Peace be upon him or, or Fatima. So there, there might be you know, a group of uh, Shiites who m might hold such an opinion, but the point is that that's the bottom line of my uh, uh, comment here is that let's uh, stick to the bandwidth that's, uh, that Prophet Muhammad has set out for us Muslims all over the world. Let's stick to that bandwidth. And if you want to narrow it, narrow it down so much and emphasize and accentuate the differences, it all comes down to, I'm going to follow this, I'm going to follow that. So there's going to be as many ways, there's going to be as many sects, there's going to be as many cults as there are human beings. Let's stick to the bandwidth. The bandwidth is set out by the Sahaba, as you all said, is set out by Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And uh, that's the bottom line. I don't, I don't believe this is the right time to accentuate the differences. Thank you very much. Well, uh, to try to deal with all the points that were raised here would require another lecture. And I'm not really in a position to do that. Uh, for the sake of the sisters who perhaps would not have heard the points raised by our brother here, uh, I will just <coughs> deal with them point by point. First point he raised was concerning Christians and Jews. That uh, we should not be, ex you know, ex exaggerating or even focusing on the differences between us and the Christians and the Jews. Well, because there are amongst the Christians and possibly amongst the Jews too, some who are very brave individuals who have gone into you know, areas of um, uh, conflict and spoken on behalf of Muslims, etc. So to stress these differences between us and them is to kind of sideline their efforts and these kind of things, when there, some of them are doing even more than many Muslims are doing. This was the brother's first point. Well, I would just say that the Quran has enough verses from Fatiha to Nas accentuating the differences between the Christians and Jews and us to say that to not do so is to not follow the Quran and Sunnah. To not follow the Quran itself. Because why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making so much of these differences throughout the Qur'an, you can hardly find a surah in which he doesn't speak about the differences between them and the true believers, etc. To, to then come along and say, well no, as Muslims we really shouldn't accent these, accentuate these differences because it's a different time. Listen, if there was a time to accentuate and a time not to, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam would have been the first to tell us. He would have told us that you know, in our times when Islam is clear and we have to deal with the Jews and the Christians, you know, we need to accentuate these differences. But in later times when Muslims are weak and you know, the Muslims, Christians are helping them out, etc., don't do it. The Prophet did not leave that information for us and he gave us a lot of details about times to come. Okay, so my first point in response to that would be that making those differences clear is very important. Very important because uh, there is a very strong movement, what they call the interfaith dialogue movement, which encourages Muslims to engage in dialogue with them. And you know, of course, when you get in these kind of dialogue situations, then you're in a position where you can't accentuate these differences. No, you have to focus on the commonality, the shared things that we all share. And that's why I said in the beginning, all these religions have these shared things. You know, we can say we are not shared things with the Hindus, with the, with the Buddhists, with everybody. We have shared principles. But, we are told to make ourselves clear. مَن تَشَبَّهَ بِقَوْمٍ فَهُوَ مِنْهُمْ Whoever imitates the way of a people are like them. This is what Prophet ﷺ told us. That imitation may be physical imitation, or it may be imitation in how we talk, how we think, how we carry ourselves. All of that is something uh, rejected by Islam. We make Islam clear. It should be clear to the people, so that people can make an informed choice. In giving da'wah, we have to make it clear. Of course, how we make it clear may depend from, on the circumstance. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to say we're going to give a talk on Islam in a group of Christians and Jews. We start off by saying all you Christians and Jews are going to hell. The only people going to paradise are Muslims. You just lost your audience. Right? So obviously this is not the method. You do present Islam in a way which is not going to be sledgehammering people's faces, but at the same time, you must make the distinction. Yes, we have common beliefs, we believe in the prophets, and we believe in so and so and so. However, Islam has a unique position with regards to the prophets of Allah. 
It has a unique position with regards to Allah Himself and with regards to the books that we all believe in and with regards to the angels and how we treat them and with regards to the last day and how it's taking place. We have distinct and different beliefs in this regard. This is our responsibility. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made that distinction. We are obliged also to make that distinction. The second point that our brother uh, shared with us was that Islam boils down to justice. So it's enough for us to just focus on the issue of justice. You know, wherever there is justice, you know, we should support it. And it's all about justice. Well, guess what? Whose definition of justice? Whose definition of justice? Because according to the rest of the world, we are unjust. Islam is unjust. For you to stone to death a person who committed adultery, this is unjust. For you to lash a person, you know, a hundred times who committed uh, fornication, that is unjust. For you to cut off the hand of a thief, that is unjust. And so on. For you to give a woman uh, half what a man is given in inheritance, that is unjust. For you to cover a woman up and so she can't show her beauty, because their philosophy is if you have it, you should flaunt it, you know that we should be able to appreciate the beauty of our women, and you want to cover up all the women, this is unjust, and so on and so forth and so forth. So they can give us a whole string of injustices in Islam. Islam is unjust from top to bottom as far as they're concerned. So, when we're talking about Islam means justice, it is justice from the perspective of Allah, from the perspective of Islam. And, the other systems, Christianity, Judaism, you know, the secular democracy of the West, this is injustice. Though they claim to stand for justice, they are unjust. They are unjust in the sense that they do not give the rights which God has prescribed to human beings as they are supposed to be given. They don't. They will kill, for example, in America, United States of America, they kill 1,300,000 babies every year in abortions. 1,300,000 every year. And they are screaming, human rights, hey, we believe in the right to life. Right? So their injustice is firmly embedded in their system. Their system of democracy is an unjust system. So I would not sum up Islam as justice. I would sum up Islam as Prophet Muhammad summed it up as morality. Prophet had said, I was only sent to perfect for you the highest of moral character traits. Morality, this is the essence of Islam. Justice falls in under the general heading of morality. Islam calls to morality and when we're giving dawah, it's important to stress that we stand for the moral principles which are universally accepted and which are revealed by Allah. The uh, third point our brother raised about the differences between sects that um, among the main uh, body of Muslims uh, where, where we shouldn't make a distinction between them today. Well, <coughs> The point of speaking about the way is one is to identify the foundation for unity of Muslims. Because as Imam Malik had said, Muslims of the latter days will not be able to correct themselves and their situation except by the same way that the Muslims of the first generation did. 
That is the only way. That is the one way. The banquet is in that one way. It is the only way for success. And as Muslims, we need to know it. Just as people, when they look at the religions around the world, we need to say Islam is the only true religion. It's the only way to God. We shouldn't be afraid to say it. Everybody else is saying it. In the end, it comes down to the evidence. What evidence do you have? And we will say, okay, we believe it because of this, 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 this. That's why we believe it. In the same way, we follow Islam in one way, based on what? The evidences. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran has identified the way. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had clarified the way. So we understand there is one way. It doesn't mean that one may not have a difference of opinion. The companions had difference of opinions. We may have differences of opinion. But in general, we follow one way. If we say, back to the banquet, uh, example which you gave, that Islam is like the banquet. Everyone can come and take from the, you know, they call it, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, uh, huh? Buffet, yes. You know, it's a buffet style meal. Everybody goes, you go with your dish, you take what you want, everybody takes what they want. So on, so. Huh? Or oh, the bandwidth. I thought you said banquet. Okay. The wide, wide, wide band. Okay, I mean, then we're talking about the Surat al Mustaqim, then we're talking about the one way. Yeah, it's one way. Okay, fine. So I can leave that example off. So, in speaking about that one way, that Surat al Mustaqim, the Sabil, because when uh, Allah has Prophet Muhammad said, Inna, inna hadha Sabili. Mustaqimah, in the Sirati Mustaqima, Fatabiru, Wala Tatabiru Subula, he said, Sabili is Sabil, the term for, for the way is one, a singular, whereas the deviant ways are many. Subul, a subul. So the distinction is made there that the way is one way. And that way was the way, as I said, understood by the companions. And this is the foundation for unity. Because if we don't identify a foundation, then everybody has his own interpretation. Just like Christianity, we end up like Christianity. You know, in Christianity, everybody has a church. You just have to have a new idea. You know, you have some people who can follow it, you can set up your own church. So you have no end of churches. So many different ways. That is Christianity. Judaism, you got the, you know, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox, you have the liberal, you have the, you know, how many different ways? No. For us, we have one way. Now, the final point which our brother raised was Sunni Shiite differences. Well, he said he follows the Sunnah and, um, you know, uh, it's the same, basically, he feels he's Sunni. And uh, Shiite, Sunni, basically, they follow the same thing. The only difference is the issue about Ali, you know, and uh, some of his descendants. Well, yes, the issue boils down to the Imamate. That is the biggest issue. There are other minor issues, which of course, which have differences, which maybe uh, we could say they're fiqh differences. Fiqh differences where Shiites, for example, permit temporary marriage. You can get married for an hour. You know, whereas the main body of Muslims say, no, 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 we don't have that. These are still fiqh differences. The main issue is about the imamit. And the difference essentially is that for Shiaism, the Imams have become intermediaries between human beings and God. That the Imams may be prayed to, may be called on in prayers, whereas for mainstream Islam, 
prayer should only be directed to God. Of course, you do have people who call themselves Sunni Muslims also, who pray to saints. And they have set up intermediaries, and this is what Sufism basically has promoted, the concept of an intermediary between one and God, who you may call on in prayer, or pray through, or a variety of different routes. And that, can I finish speaking please? Can I finish speaking please? Let me finish. I waited patiently and allowed you to say everything you wanted to say. Now allow me to finish speaking. You know, and later if you want to uh, get back, we can get back. I'm saying that this is the essential difference that uh, distinguishes uh, Shiites from Sunni Muslims, that they have attributed attributes to the Imams, attributes which mainstream Islam consider to be unique to Allah, among them attributes of omniscience, knowing all things, knowing the past, present, and future, etc. And these are in the books that are a main part of Shiite uh, belief systems. And these differences lead uh, Shiites to put their Imams as intermediaries. And anyone who does that, whether they are Shiite or whether they are Sunni, this is considered a deviation from the original message. The original message is that we worship Allah alone, we put no one between ourselves and Allah, we don't call on anyone besides Allah, as Prophet had said, Ad-Dua huwa al-Ibadah. Calling on anyone besides Allah is an act of worship. Okay, hold on a second. Let me respond to that because it's being point by point. Well, you can contact the uh, organization called uh, Tarsili. Uh, what's it called? Uh, Tarsili Quran. This group, which is in uh, in New York, which is in New York, uh, where you can order Qurans from, <coughs> a Shiite organization which distributes Qurans, uh, including the Quran uh, which the, translated by Shiite uh, Shakir, this uh, individual Muhammad Shakir, somebody uh, translated the Quran, and he has books there uh, of prayers, prayer books. And you can order from him the prayer books. And in those prayer books, and I have a copy of the prayer books, there are prayers directed to the Imams. Calling on the Imams, Ya Ali, Ya Hassan, Ya Hussein, in prayer. You can find these in the writings of Ali Shariati. In the many books of his which are translated to English, you can find him directing prayers directly to Fatima, Ya Fatima, etc. And these are clear evidences and I know Shiites also, you know, I live, I've lived among Shiites, and they do say that they pray to the Imams and through the Imams. And not only that, we have people who consider themselves to be Sunni Muslims who do the same.